What's up everybody? My name is Dean Chessman and today I'm going to be showing you how I made this time warp effect in Touch Designer. The project file for this will be available to my Patreon supporters and you can find the link for that below. Let's get started. Uh, so with this project, the main thing that we're going to be using is a, is a top that's called the time machine top. And uh, let me explain first how that works. So um, I've already got a little bit of a setup here. I have an audio file in, which is just the default touch designer song uh, that comes comes with it. And I've set that to mono so that I only have one signal. I also brought in a couple of videos that, um, that I had for, um, I've used in previous tutorials, but they're from pexels.com and um, you can you can find lots of cool videos there. The important part about this project with that is that these this effect seems to have or it works a lot better if you have a video where the camera is not moving a lot, where you have a static camera either on a tripod or just uh, maybe in slow motion or whatever. So there's not a lot of camera movement, so you don't get a lot of extra noise with the movement. <clears throat> okay, uh, so you know I'm going to be switching between these different videos just by dragging them into this null that I've called video. And to show how this time machine works, so the thing that I need, the time machine takes two inputs. The first input needs to be from, uh, from a texture 3D. So I'm gonna pick up a texture 3D and I'm gonna feed my video into it. And I'm gonna feed that into the first input of my, my time machine. So the texture 3D is essentially a caching, uh, a caching top. So it's gonna store uh, the previous number of frames that's set by this cache size. So right now I'm setting 32, so I have 32 um, different textures that I have in the side of this um, texture 3D. So this this top can add up a lot as far as how much memory you're using in your project, so be aware of that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set a, um, a constant so that I can change how long my, um, how long my cache goes to. So um, let's do cache size inside of constant, and I'm going to set mine to 90. I'm going to activate it and drag it into the texture 3D in the cache size as a reference. So when I change that, it updates it. Um, now I have 90, uh, but you know this time machine is still not doing anything. So why why is that? So the second input for a time machine is expecting a grayscale image. So um, let's let's do that. So I'm going to bring this into. Let's start with a ramp, and I'm going to only output the res or the ramp itself by using the input as set of resolution only. And let's make it a vertical ramp. Okay, when I drag that in, you'll see now I get some weird stuff happening. And what it's doing um, is it's using this, this second input, the ramp, to, um, to decide which pixel, uh, each pixel in this is going to decide which cached image it's going to pull from. And inside the time machine, you'll see in the, in the parameters here, that the black values will take the negative 60th frame, so 60 frames ago, and the white pixel will take the newest frame, so the current the current frame. So the newest things in the video are happening at the top right now, and the ones that happened 60 frames ago are at the bottom. Um, so this is where I'm also gonna reference my cache size. So I want um, to use the maximum amount of what I have here in my texture 3D. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drag my cache size also into this black offset as a reference, and then put it in as a negative number. So now, um, no matter how big or small I make this cache, it'll always use that full range from black to white. Okay, so already, I mean, we have kind of a cool effect, kind of sort of slit scan effect. We could, you know, use this. We could drop the period down so we have multiple in here, and instead of repeat, we can mirror. So we get, you know, this sort of fun um, slit scanning effect happening. Um, one reminder as well as I'm doing this, so, um, any video I'm using for this, you might notice like maybe you get a lot of jagged sort of edges and like you'll still see it happening like some of this, um, you know, the choppiness between frames because I just don't have enough data. Um, one thing that'll help that is if you go into the video input and interpolate images, especially if your video frame rate, like these are 25 frames a second, 30, 30 frames a second, but I'm running at 60. And so if you turn on interpolation, then you'll get uh, interpolated frames between each of your frames, which will smooth out what your output is. That's gonna come in more too, as we do like this sort of, um, this optical flow um, effect on the end here as well. So, okay, so what if I wanna make this effect um, audio reactive in some way? So the way I can do that, I have my audio file in here. 
I'm going to bring that into an analyze and I'm going to use RMS power uh, and I'm going to use a trail to visualize what you're seeing here. So right now my analyze for RMS power goes up to what is this about, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.55 kind of thing as the highest value. But I want to um, I want to normalize that. And the way you do that with audio channel is you put it into an envelope and uh, I'm going to change my envelope width to be the full 10 seconds that it wants there. And then what the envelope is doing is it's it's taking a look at the previous 10 seconds. So like if I actually make this, uh, I can make this trail 10 seconds. It looks at all of these and finds what you know the, what my maximum value here is. And uh, what I can do with that is, but to normalize it, all I have to do is divide my my value here by that envelope. So um, I take it into a math, put the envelope in as a second value, and then combine them by dividing. So now if I do another trail to visualize what's going on. Now you see my loudest points hit one consistently. So I can be pretty confident that that's my beat that I want. And I could either just use this value straight up or if I want to have a little more control over my beat, I'm gonna, I can put it into a trigger. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go into a trigger and then nothing's happening here because right now my trigger threshold is zero and I'm never getting back down fully to zero. So I'm gonna change this to be like 0.98 actually because I'm just gonna wanna catch these very top um, beats that are happening. Again, I'm gonna bring it into a trail so you can see what this looks like. So this is my in signal coming in, my trigger going up and down. Um, I'm gonna change some of my values here so I can um, make this a little smoother, maybe a little more what I want. So. Um, attack length 0.2 is fine. I'm going to turn my peak length off so it drops. Um, the sustain and decay, um, I'm trying to remember what I have here for this. So if I sustain at 1, if I decay slowly, okay, I think this is about what I want. I want it to just, you know, bounce up and down every time there's a beat. You know, I want it to jump back 60 or jump back in the frames of the video and back up to itself. Um, and you'll see what that uh, that effect ends up, ends up looking like here in a second. So um, let's rename this. I'm gonna call it beat, put it into a null. I'm also gonna call that beat. And then, um, okay, so how I'm gonna use this. So um, let's see what it looks like here just with this ramp right now. So if I bring in um, a constant after my ramp, the constant chop, um, obviously you can make a constant with full color, but by default when it has a, something coming into the input, it's going to multiply that operation by the input. So um, if I take my beat value and assign that to the color, then it's going to multiply that color by that value. And already you can see, you know, we kind of get effect happening that's to the beat. Um, you know, it's just using that ramp. The ramp's not even moving right now. Maybe if I animated it, it'd be more interesting. Uh, the effect that I liked more, though, is is using noise. And before I do that, I'm going to go and drag this to an out and then hit right click and view so I can have a little preview in the corner here of my changes as I make them. <clears throat> okay, so let's make a noise. So if I drag my video into a noise, because I want to use that to set my resolution, if I'm only going to use the, the noise output so I don't have my video coming in with it. And then uh, I want to copy and paste this constant here because I'm going to use that. And let's make this noise. Let's, well, let's go and plug it in so you can kind of see what's happening. So I'm getting that sort of liquidy effect. That's not really what I'm looking for. I'm going to pump my period up, bring my harmonic gain down. Because, um, yeah, I just want it to sort of like almost be believable that she's, you know, doing these dance moves to the beat. You know, it's kind of warping her around a little bit, but that's still, I think I'm still okay with that. Um, yeah, cool. So already I like the spec. Let's see what it looks like on some of the other ones here. You know, and you can imagine like, this is just with the beat that's happening. It can make this very slow motion ballerina look like it's, you know, dancing to the beat of whatever I'm playing through the audio input. Um, here's my koi fish. So again, you get sort of dancey in and out. Uh, one thing I know I'm going to want to do actually, instead of just having this static noise, let's let's animate it. So let's do apps time dot seconds inside my my noise transform under the Z parameter of the translate. 
Um, so that's going to allow it so that, um, you know, there's still some sort of wiggling and stuff happening, even, um, even in between like the beat changes and stuff like that, or if the beat sustains, it'll, it'll keep that. Um, and just also will make it look different every time. Um, if it's a more static image also, here's like a, a cool wave crashing sort of effect. I've seen, seen this effect around on a couple of different like, uh, Instagram accounts and things like that. Um, it's an easy way to get this this sort of effect with that. Um, yeah, okay, so let's kind of add on this cool post-processing effect too that I liked with this. And this is gonna use, um, it's gonna use my optical flow. Um, An optical flow can be found in your palette under tools, under optical flow. And I use it all the time for all sorts of different cool effects. Essentially what optical flow does is it takes a video input and then for each pixel, it tries to, uh, it tries to estimate which direction it thinks that pixel is moving. And uh, the red values are doing the left to right. So it goes negative to positive, left to right. And the green values are, are up and down, negative and positive as well. Um, super useful for a lot of different things. For this, we're just gonna sort of do it as a um, most motion detection sort of like, um, like sample. So like we don't care about the direction that the pixel is going or anything like that. We just want to know, you know where's the most motion happening and let's uh, let's filter by that threshold. So I'm actually gonna because the way this works, you know, it's doing it pixel by pixel in a large video like what these are. Uh, the pixels are very small, and I want to I want to blow those up a little bit. So and it also will make it more efficient. So I'm gonna re or do a resolution. I'm gonna drop it down by an eighth even. Um, and already there you, you see the pixels are, are bigger here. And then I'm going to, after the fact, re-res it back up 8x. So I'm, I'm back to my, my standard resolution. And then um, I want this to be, like I said, it's, it's positive and negative values, but I just want them all. Um, so I want them all to be positive. So they all show up in kind of the visual, um, visual pixels because negative pixels are not, uh, not rendered. So, okay, I'm getting getting some interesting stuff already there. And I'm hitting A and N to see that view. Uh, and then, let's see, from my limit, let's go ahead and go into a threshold and bring our threshold down. Okay, cool. So now we're getting kind of the, based on where I bring this threshold, I'm getting where the biggest movement is happening. And uh, I'm going to tweak this a little more by, before I res it back up, I'm going to blur it a little bit just to sort of denoise some of this value. Yeah, and you'll see it smooths smooth things out a little bit more. Can even bring that maybe down a tiny bit. And then I'm going to pump this into a, a bloom. And I'm only going to take the bloom output. Let's bring our intensity up even more as well. Cool. And then I'm going to add that bloom over the top of my, my output here. Cool. And now, let's see, I want it to be a little more prominent, so maybe we'll drop our threshold a little bit to bring in more. There we go. And, um, you know, if I wanted to as well, I mean, I like how the white adds to it, but if I wanted to add color, I, again, I could just use a constant and, you know, put on like maybe a little yellow or blue or, you know, whatever, magenta. Just to add that extra, extra interest there. Uh, let's see, let's look at our other videos, see what those look like in here. Takes a second always to, to get the texture 3D filled back up. Cool. Let's do our ballerina. And you'll notice too, if I if I switch videos and they're the same resolution, it doesn't have to it doesn't have to reset my texture 3D. The, te the texture 3D will automatically reset if um, if the resolution coming in is different. So, like for example, if I put this koi pond in there, it'll restart and you'll get that kind of black screen. So, if you're wanting to do some sort of live visual of this. Um, you know, you'll want to have before you have a switch or whatever is going to be changing your video input, like have um, a fit top or a resolution top that that um, 
keeps the resolution the same so you don't get that blackout sort of uh, transition. So like this, I switch to the, the wave crashing and it swaps out without losing my, my frames. Anyway, I thought this was kind of cool effect. Um, I'd love to see the kind of things you guys make of this. I mean, an another effect that I've seen with this sort of, of sort of thing is like using this same effect with our sort of blob tracker that we've done in previous videos um, to blob track where the motion is. So like maybe instead of doing the bloom on top of this, you could add um, the blob tracker, you know, to this to this data. And that way you get the kind of cool trace and blob track on top of this as well. Um, but yeah, anyway, I wanted to keep this one fairly short and um, show you something cool. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you make anything, be sure to tag me and uh, share. I'll reshare anything. Anybody tags with me if they make, make something with my tutorials. I love seeing it. And um, also, if you want this project file that I've just made, I will make it available to all of my Patreon supporters. So you can find the links to that uh, in my in my feed below. Also, I am a freelance touch center developer. So if you have any projects that you uh, want done or you want to collaborate on or um, if you just need help with, uh, feel free to reach out. I'll put my contact link in the uh, description below as well. Thanks so much.